I'm Sammy Jacobs. This is David Sugarman from HoosierHuddle.com, our first on-camera post-game show. Uh, Indiana Falls 49-21 to Ohio State tonight, uh, number two ranked Buckeyes. Indiana was in it early, got out to a 14-6 lead, uh, took a 21-20 lead, answered Ohio State there in the third quarter, but ultimately uh, they got outscored 36-7 in the second half. Uh, they did some good things in the first half. Simi Cobbs looks like a monster. He looks like the best receiver in the Big Ten. Uh, Richard Lego he threw 30, 65 passes, which was a it just school record. Mm -hmm. He beat Ben Chappell's record uh, from 2010 against Michigan. Uh, but the, the passing game was there. Ohio State adjusted in the second half. Uh, you could get it done. What happened in the second half that snowballed to this 49-21 defeat? You know, even when they had the lead at halftime, Richard Lego at that point had thrown the ball 38 times, and there was just sort of this air in the press conference that, uh, or rather in the press box, if he's got to throw the ball, you know, close to 80 times, it didn't quite get that far. But if he's got to throw the ball 60, 70 times, then Ohio State's just going to figure it out and or at least be able to contain them. And in large part, they were able to do that in the second half. And I'm torn on IU's running game, whether it was just a lack of commitment or it's just not there. And I think it was a little bit of both. Even early on, yeah, I think their first scoring, their first drive when they scored, it was a 12-play drive, nine passes, three rushing, uh, three running plays, and they did score a touchdown. But that just sort of set the tone for the game. That even they didn't even want to run the ball. Even if it was only going to be one-yard gains and they weren't going to get uh, get much, I think they just had to run the ball to keep Ohio State honest, and they never really showed a commitment. I think it was a total of 17 rushing attempts for 27 yards, not counting uh, all the negative yards from the sacks of Richard Lego, which there were five of, including the strip sack late. Yeah, if you take away those those sacks, it's it, it was only 47 rushing non-sack rushing yards, yeah. which in college football, if you guys don't know. Rushing yards are counted, or sacks are counted against the rushing mm -hmm. yards, whereas in the NFL they're counted against the passing yards. So the running game was not there. The IU offensive line needs to get better. Right. They, I mean, Ohio State's defensive line, Tom Allen talked about it in his press conference. They have five guys who they think are going to be first-round draft picks in the NFL. So you're going against an NFL-caliber defensive line, and you can see it. Lego didn't have much time. I thought the game plan was good. They used that short passing game, got those one-on-one -on -one matchups with, with the corners, which they clearly explored, uh, exploited until the second half when they had Simi and Donovan Hale. Uh, uh, Taysier Mack got in the action there as well. Um, so, you know, they did a lot of good things, but this offensive line for next week needs to get better. We saw Harry Kreider play at center mm -hmm. late in the second half. He might get bumped up to start. Uh, hopefully Brandon Knight is back next week. If Brandon Knight could come back next week, he could take Delroy's spot at um, left tackle mm. or one of the tackle spots, uh, and, and that should improve the line. But this is the best defensive line that IU is going to play all year. Without a doubt, but they will see some more really good uh, defensive lines in the Big Ten. And as they keep going forward, you know, we saw Peyton Ramsey for a series tonight. We also saw him late in the game in garbage time. We saw him in a series, I think it was, I don't know, it was late in the first quarter, early in the second. He came in, got a first down, uh, had the short pass to, I think it was to, to Watercutter or Thomas maybe, water and then cutter. to Watercutter. Uh, had a couple of nice rushes, and, and that was really the most they'd gotten all night, uh, all night. Late, they got a couple of garbage runs from Morgan Ellison. I mean, played okay, seven runs for 24 yards. Yards, but none of them really of any significance. And uh, I, they, I'm, they're just going to have to find somebody who they don't have a true number one back, is what I'm trying to right. say. And it's tough when you know game one, and they already had to get a little bit gimmicky. And uh, I don't know if it's because of, and I don't want to speculate if it was any injury issues or not. I was surprised that we didn't see Tyler Nady at all tonight. Um, but you know, whether it be Mike Majet, I mean, or Cole Guest, or Morgan Ellison, they said they're going to do it by committee. Um, and they just need to show more of a commitment. So if that means giving, you know, five different guys 10 carries, maybe not 10, but, you know, five or six carries, that means even one guy 15 or 20, even if it, you know, if Majette had gone for 40 yards tonight, at least it's a commitment to the run that they didn't show. Yeah, there, there were a couple times, you know, IU missed a lot of chances. I think mm -hmm. having that running game, uh, we said on the pregame show, 
uh, tailgate show as well. Yeah. They became one dimensional, and not exactly. having that running game shortened, you know, it lengthened the game. Mm -hmm. When you pass the ball, there's going to be more incompletions, more clock stoppages. Whereas if you could run, you know, if you could get to that 100 yard mark, you move the chains, you keep that clock running, and you, you chew up some of that time and, and shorten the game. Uh, the running game just wasn't there. Uh, you saw their game plan was to come out and throw it quickly. I thought mm -hmm. the game plan was good. Uh, it was interesting not seeing Tyler Nate because you think this mm -hmm. is the kind of defense that Tyler and the team, especially in the goal line, uh, that, that they would uh, use him in. Uh, but, you know, we'll find out next week against Virginia if this running game, if it's an offensive line issue, if it's just that they played an outstanding defensive line, or if it's just they don't have a number one guy. And that open, I, coming out of fall camp, I thought this running back group was pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, I still think it's pretty good, but we have to see what they could do against Virginia. If they can't produce a run game against Virginia, it, it, it's going to be a long season, and, and you have to see what uh, you know what that running back group is like. You know, I think it's probably a combination of really all of those things. And I, I want to touch on the defense for that. Uh, one of the bright spots, and uh, particularly with Lego, was I mean he got a lot of help from a lot of different places. I mean, so Nick Westbrook goes down early. The only thing we know now is that he's getting an MRI on his knee tomorrow morning. First play of the game, he was on the kickoff unit. Not really sure why, but he was on the kickoff unit and. Uh, he went down um, trying to make, I think, the tackle, and he's going to get an MRI on his knee tomorrow. But So Luke Timion talked about how his play and his usage went up a lot more. He made, I think it was 10 catches for 70-some yards. Uh, Simi Cobbs went for over 100 yards. I think he had his career high in, I know, in receptions, and I think in yards as well. Um, and we really saw the back shoulder throw was really, really popular tonight on the sideline, not even uh, going deep all that often, 10, 15, 20 yards down the field. And one of the things that I really liked tonight, because uh, frankly we expected this type of greatness out of Simi Cods, was that there was so much talk over the offseason of how IU wanted to use the tight ends more. And we saw Ian Thomas tonight make two touchdowns. He ended up with four or five catches. That was really a bright spot. We, we saw offensively from a passing standpoint they were really versatile. It wasn't just the defense deep ball and Ohio State didn't want to give up the deep ball they wanted uh, they were willing to let IU dink and dunk them and they did it to the tune of 400 some yards for Richard Lego yeah I, I thought Richard Lego's performance was was pretty solid mm -hmm. you know especially for letting him sling the ball around 65 times yeah I uh, had that early pick uh, down in the uh, down in the red zone mm. right in this corner here and you kind of in the back of your mind said oh here we go again it's mm. very similar to that play against uh, Wake Forest where it's a tip ball uh, or a deflected ball that goes off of somebody where IU probably scores points and and gets taken back but he bounced back great I thought he played there were times he just did not have a lot of time to throw and that sped up the offense but I think you know it's pumped the brakes on Richard Lego's mm -hmm. uh, you know the criticism of him I thought he played very well tonight and credit in the first half to the defense particularly on that on that interception it gets run back to the 40 and then there's a couple of really big plays and all of a sudden Ohio State's in the red zone and for the second time they get they get held to a field goal um, so in the first half, I thought the defense was really good. In the second half, we saw the running game. I mean, Dobbins, who he ain't the second string running back anymore, but he came into the game as second string running back. Freshman, with, yeah, says freshman record. Yeah, he uh, finishes Russian with 29 carries, 181 yards. He didn't even score a touchdown. Antonio Williams ends up getting two. Barrett wasn't great in the air, 20 for 35. He ends up with 304 yards and three scores. And... We saw, similar to Indiana, I mean, I don't know that Ohio State was afraid of Indiana's secondary, but they didn't test them deep an awful lot. They tested them deep down the right side once, and they got an interference call, and there's maybe one or two other incompletions. It was those two plays, the one to Paris Campbell, and then the one, uh, the, the other receivers escaping me right now. Warren. Uh, it was, forgetting who it was right now, but the point is, they were. there was a 59-yard catch and a 75-yard catch but both were maybe 5, 10 yards down the field. Some great blocking downfield by the Ohio State receivers and then, uh, then then some poor tackling by Indiana. And that was a big theme, I thought, late in the game, whether it be Dobbins, who was really shifty going east to west before he made a move north-south. Uh, and then as well with the receivers, you know, they had trouble catching up to receivers and they had trouble wrapping them up, the ball carries and the receivers. Yeah, that's the trouble with, with first games, especially in college. You don't have those preseason games mm -hmm. to get the live tackling in. Uh, that you do in the NFL. And then secondly, they ran out of gas. I was on the sideline for the entire game taking photos, and you could see, you know, Tigray Scales, hands on his hips, late in the third quarter. They were just gassed, and especially when you don't get a pass rush, like 
they, they failed to do tonight and just chasing the ball down and especially in that second half when they did not mm -hmm. sustain drives and keep that defense off the field they, they just ran out of gas and, and you got to find some some role players off the bench to come in and spell these guys and they just couldn't do it tonight you know they get a couple extra days rest they're going to Virginia next week of course next Saturday this is Thursday well I guess Friday morning now but um, going into next week, obviously Virginia, not the animal that uh, Ohio State is, but really, this was, it, it's sort of weird after playing Ohio State and you got the Big Tennies coming up that Virginia, for a lot of people, I know you talked about this a lot over the summer, is one of the bigger games of the season. It's a must win because if they had upset Ohio State, you can't lose to Virginia and have that hangover game. And now that they've lost to Ohio State, Indiana's not a team that can afford to go 0-2. They probably can't lose any non-conference games. Yeah, this, you know, I, I, I've been harking on it all summer. As you said, this is the most important game coming up for IU is, mm -hmm. is UVA. Uh, it's, especially going to the non-conference games, you have to go 3-0 mm -hmm. in the, your non-conference. If you come back 0-2, that means you're, let's say you beat FIU and beat Georgia Southern, you're two and two. You have to get out of October at four and three. Right. Um, and that sets you up for a big November. Uh, you're at least going into the Rutgers, Illinois, Purdue right. series with four wins uh, and just needing two out of three. So we'll see how this team turns it around this was it was an electric atmosphere tonight the place is rocking absolutely so credit credit to the students the alumni fans they stayed uh, until it was you know basically decided yeah until really, so it became maybe 42 21 that's sort of when it started yeah out. but they stayed through halftime uh and, and it was a terrific atmosphere but how do you decompress from this game go to virginia uh, who's the atmosphere is not going to be the same, right? Uh, and, and go out there and and prove that you're the better team. Uh, you know, I don't think Virginia's secondary is going to be much better than Ohio State's. Mm -hmm. Their defensive line certainly is not as good. Uh, they do have two All Americans. They have an All American safety and an All American linebacker. Uh, but you know, if you give Richard Lego this the time, this receiving core is as good as advertised. Absolutely, and you know, and and hopefully if Westbrook's put you back, and hopefully it wasn't a serious injury, then. You know, only going to be better and the only uh, thing I, I want to touch on uh, lastly defensively the defensive line we talked about they were going to need somebody on not uh, on the line to sort of emerge as a pass rusher and they only had one sack tonight from Robert McRae and I mean it seemed like that was the only time unless he was running the ball downfield that Barrett even hit the turf I mean he really had all day in the pocket and with a guy who was a more accurate passer probably would have picked him apart even with IU's really good secondary. Tom Allen talked about it after the game and really said that they it was more dropping back in coverage. They were dropping eight back a lot and I get that to a certain degree because he didn't have a lot of confidence in Barrett that he was going to pick him apart down the field but even with that I mean for, forget about the sacks for a moment. I'd be the hard press to say they had more than like three or four hurries tonight maybe they had one knockdown outside of the sack i mean I, I, they, they need to find a way to get after the quarterback even if they're going to be dropping uh, eight back like coach allen said and, and more on that point being at field level you they didn't get their hands up and you know you hear coaches say this a lot if you can't get to the quarterback Get your hands up and knock down the passes. Right. And at least what I noticed is that these defensive linemen's hands were not up, mm -hmm. uh, and you can't bat down passes like that. So there were it was a clean, uh, you know, line of sight for Barrett. Well, he, I, I wasn't impressed with his throwing, but you know those short passes. If you get a hand up and knock one of those down, talking about a different ball game. So they need to find, like you said, they need to find a pass rusher mm -hmm. somewhere. Is that going to be? You know, one of these true freshmen like Lance Bryant coming mm -hmm. coming on, uh, but it, it was that they you cannot survive in the Big Ten East with with that that kind of pass rush unless you start blitzing Scales and Covington and just putting all your trust into that secondary. Without a doubt, and you know, in like no disrespect to Ohio State, I mean they're talented. They're the number two team in the nation. I can say, I mean, just watching J T. Barrett, I mean he he does a lot of things well. I don't think he's the quarterback of a, of a playoff caliber team you know especially with the rest of the Big Ten East and we talk about you know Michigan and Penn and Penn State I mean look it's early in the season and there's no reason he can't improve but night one I 
I didn't see it. I, I I just didn't see. It. I mean, there are a lot of things he does well, but he didn't he didn't pass the ball the ball well. And I think if if he had they had gotten in his face tonight, he would have struggled. Yeah, yeah even it, more. It, it was a lot like last year where they struggled passing the ball, and mm-hmm. then they went to that read option game. And Jake K. Dobbins, we talked about it before. He was terrific. Uh, but yeah, they might make the playoff with with Barrett. Uh, they got to beat Oklahoma next week, but. Mm-hmm. Can they beat an Alabama as a one-dimensional right. team running that read option without without a passing threat? I don't think so. But anyway, uh, it's late. Let's wrap this up. <laughs> uh, for Sammy Jacobs, I'm Sammy Jacobs. This is David Sugarman. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll be uh, live from Virginia next week. Uh, get some sleep, some rest. Enjoy the first weekend of college football. It's a free Saturday for us. Uh, <laughs> and enjoy the rest of your night.